Hello and welcome to Star USA Training. Today is Tuesday, May 9th, and we'll be talking about HTS classification and some of the recent rulings that CBP has handed down. I'll answer questions throughout and take more at the end. There will also be some polls through the webinar, and I hope you'll participate. It's a great way to do some group HTS classification and test yourself, and they're anonymous, so there's no need to be shy. There is one NCB FAA credit available for continuing education credits for CES and CCS participants. The code will be provided at the end of the webinar and in the email we send out with the recording. Star USA is a consulting, advice, training, and services firm in the field of international trade and compliance. We're based out of Northeast Ohio, and for the past few decades, we've provided an array of services to importers, exporters, brokers, carriers, and forwarders of many different sizes and skill levels. My name's Joe Harper, and I'm a principal at Star USA. I have my customs broker license, and I've been in the industry for about 12 years. I'm looking forward to digging into some of the way customs is looking at classification currently with you. We're going to start with a quick overview of the HTS and classification using the United States tariff. It will not go deeply into any specific topic or any specific category of item. This part of the webinar sets the foundations for understanding the HTS and its different varieties, why they matter, and how they are used and applied by federal agencies, importers, exporters, brokers, and freight forwarders. Throughout this series, I'm going to use HTS or HTSUS as my preferred terminology, but the underlying principles should be broadly applicable regardless of which system you're using in the moment. First, let's take a quick look at the WCO and the difference between the HS, HTSUS, and the Schedule B. The WCO, the World Customs Organization, has been around in some form for almost 70 years with the first meeting held in January of 1953, so exactly 70 years, with 17 founding member states. It was originally called the Customs Cooperation Council and changed to the World Customs Organization in 1994. It's responsible for, among other things, establishing the common tariff nomenclature known as the Harmonized System that's used by more than 180 WCO members and more than 98% of global trade. It is an independent intergovernmental organization charged with providing advice on ways to achieve the maximum possible uniformity and harmony in customs legislation and procedures to prevent barriers to international trade. It plays an essential role in international trade streamlining. Here in the US, we call the harmonized system, the harmonized tariff schedule, but internationally it's known as the harmonized system or sometimes the harmonized code. The United States International Trade Commission also makes periodic updates as well as Congress ratifying it. An update to the base harmonized system is made every five years. It's made on the twos and the sevens. So the most recent one, most recent major implementation was in 2022. The next major overhaul of the harmonized system will come out in 2027. The United States ratified it in 1989. Prior to that, we had our own internal classification of goods that had been used for 200 some years. We are currently on revision four for the 2023 HTS. Classification as a concept means that you find the commodity number that best describes the product. It's a legal requirement to classify imported items accurately according to the HTS, that's under 19 USC 1201, and to classify them accurately for export reporting under 15 CFR. Any organization that's responsible for importing or exporting things must be able to correctly classify them. Under our laws, it's the responsibility of the US entity to correctly classify, not the responsibility of their broker or filer. They may provide guidance, but they are not legally responsible. The harmonized system is the basis of 
almost all global commerce and trade policy in the world. It's again updated every five years by the World Customs Organization. And that is mainly to keep up with technologies or trade practices and to provide visibility on the decisions and the way that the global customs are thinking about things internationally. The latest revision took effect in January 2022. The next one is January 2027. In the harmonized system, there's more than 5,000 classifications, and that goes to the six digits. So that's the section, chapter, and a heading, and they're universally used by all WCO members. Because those six digits, that's the first six digits of a classification, are internationally standard, it doesn't count as customs business to classify an item to the six digit. That may not mean much to any importers on this webinar, but it does to the brokers who are on. Every country that uses the HS uses those same six digits. Some countries only use those six digits. It's very few of them. Almost all countries add additional digits up to four to set their own duty rates and account for the information that they want to keep track of for their country. In the US, we take the WCO system and we use it as the basis for our tariff, the harmonized tariff schedule of the United States. The HTS US Schedule A is used for imports and it's recorded on all import entry filings into the United States. It informs any tariff related programs, including USMCA and other free trade agreements, anti dumping and countervailing duty application, Section 232, Section 301, and many more. There's more than 18,000 classifications to the 10th digit across those 22 sections and 99 chapters. In the US, our classifications are 10 digit long. The first six are from the HS. And then we have two at the tariff item level where duty rates are applied and two more for statistical reporting. Then we have the Schedule B, and that's used for statistical reporting of U.S. exports. Most exports can use the HTS U.S. Schedule A number, but there are specific items that require the export reporting number. Those are found in the notice to exporters at the beginning of the tariff. Many exporters prefer using the Schedule B for their exports because it's simpler than the Schedule A. There's only about 9,000 Schedule B classifications across 22 sections and 98 chapters. It is also 10 digits long, but much of import reporting is looking to break items out into categories in a way that calls out information that our domestic industry cares about, and we care less about what we are selling, what we are exporting, because we are benefiting domestic industry by exporting it and selling it. So that's why the complexity is greater on Schedule A than Schedule B. Quick recap, HS is set by the WCO. It's the first six digits. That's what often appears on commercial documents shared between the buyer and the seller, things like invoices, purchase orders, certificates of origin, and the like. Many free trade agreement certificates are only to six digits so that they can be used across borders. Then the HTS US Schedule A is used on import entry filing. It is just an extension of the harmonized system it should be the same to the first six digits. You as the importer need to get the classification from the seller and then figure out the correct HTS US to file on your import entry. And the Schedule B is used for EEI filing. It again is an extension of the harmonized system. It's slightly simpler than the HTS US Schedule A. Classification, again, is a matter of law, and it was ratified in 1989. It's for physical goods. US ITC is responsible for maintaining and publishing the Schedule A, whereas Census maintains the Schedule B. 
and customs enforces all of the laws. We have a really good question here where we have a product that in Mexico, Mexico customs ruled it's 8531. Canada customs ruled that it's classified under the heading 8531 and US customs ruled it's classified under 8517. Now the question here says that US customs determined it via a customs form 28 or a customs form 29. So that is not necessarily quite the same as US customs providing a ruling. That's a US customs specialist or center officer who is making a determination based on their knowledge. So you could turn around and provide US Customs headquarters with detail on the product and request that they put out a ruling. It should be very uncommon to have this happen where different customs authorities in different countries require different HTS for the same item, but it does happen. That is one reason that the World Customs Organization exists. They rule on these kinds of conflicts all of the time. When that happens, if you are unable to convince one or the other customs agency to agree with each other, then you just have to use the correct classification for that country when you bring it into that country. Usually it is because one of the customs agencies does not fully understand the product. Sometimes it is because the different customs agencies have different interpretations, and that is when the WCO gets involved. The HS is hierarchically structured, so it starts out with raw materials are simple products in lower section or chapter numbers, and then finished goods in higher section or chapter numbers. And then each section covers a group of commodities that would be grouped together in a normal industrial sector. Sections are in Roman numerals, and then the chapter numbers are in our typical numbering. Sections one through four cover agricultural and food sectors. Section five is mineral products. Section six is chemical products. Section 11 covers textiles. Section 16 is machinery and electrical equipment, and section 17 is vehicles. In the U.S., chapters 1 through 97 are for merchandise. Chapter 98 is special classification provisions. Chapter 99 covers temporary legislation and modifications of duty rates. Here's a quick overview of the sections and chapters of the tariff. You can see that there isn't really any logic to how many chapters are under a given section. Section two has eight chapters and section three has one chapter. This is a pretty handy way to look at things if you are. It's nice to see at a glimpse where things are classified. Don't forget about chapters 98 and 99. They are US specific, but they contain a lot of great detail. And you can find classifications for your items under those chapters. Each chapter is divided into various four digit headings. It's these first four numbers before the decimal. For example, 2933 is the 33rd item in chapter 29. Each heading is then divided into various six digit headings. So 293311, 293319, and those are indented. Each subheading can be divided into several more subdivisions down to the 10 digit statistical classification. So the first six digits are always the international harmonized code or harmonized schedule. And then the last four are US specific. The first eight digits is where the duty rate is set. And then the last two are statistical reporting. Within the HTS, there are many notes that are extremely important. So the chapters of the HTS with the headings and the subheadings are where you're gonna spend a lot of time, but the notes guide a lot of the decisions that you will make. The first are the GRIs that we're gonna talk about in a little while. They provide the overall context for classification. The general notes are rules for applying the HTS, 
they are where a lot of detail about free trade agreements or other tariff structure are provided. They have conditions that you have to meet to get preferential treatment in the tariff. Section notes are found at the beginning of most sections and they provide definitions for the way that things are covered in that specific section. They may state what's included or excluded from a section. Chapter notes are internationally prescribed. The U.S. cannot change them. They could be heading or subheading notes, whether that's at the four-digit or the six-digit level. In 98 and 99, Congress establishes those chapter notes, and that's for getting the criteria for duty treatment in those chapters and subchapters. U.S. notes are enacted by Congress, or they define terms of the eight-digit U.S. subheadings. They cannot change the meaning of the international legal notes. And then statistical notes are at the 10-digit level, and they explain how to report, import, and export data. Here's an example of a page of the HTS. You can see that there's multiple columns. We're in chapter 62 in the very first heading. So we opened chapter 62, we went past the chapter notes, and now we're into the meat of the tariff. The first column contains the first eight digits, and you can see the heading here and then the various subheadings. The next has the statistical suffixes, and then comes the article descriptions. You want to really carefully note the level of indent here. That tells you what is a subset of preceding information. So anything under this indent is of wool or fine animal hair, and that means that there's going to be something further down that's not of wool or fine animal hair. The three digit numbers here are the textile visa categories, which are used for quota. And then is a unit of quantity, and that tells the broker what units must be reported to customs. So here it's dozen and kilograms. Sometimes it's meters squared, sometimes it's numbers, sometimes it's nothing. Then there are the rates of duty. So column one, actually covers two options, the general rate of duty without a trade agreement and the special rate of duty that applies when an article meets the originating requirements for a specific general note. The general rate of duty has footnotes and an example of that is here. This footnote indicates that for this classification, you should refer to 9903-8815 that's saying that there is a Section 301 classification possible, applying if goods are from China. These abbreviations in the special column tell us which special program applies for that particular HTS. And then finally is column two. That covers countries that we are charging a higher rate of duty in order to discourage imports. So first up, I'm going to end our first poll, we asked, what does 6201-2011-20 cover? So that is this classification right here. Your options were men's wool cloaks. That would have been 6201-2011-10. Boys anoraks, which would have been somewhere down here. They're not specifically available yet. Padded sleeveless jackets, that would have been 6201-2019-100 or boys' wool cloaks, which is the correct answer. Which most of you got, way to go. Okay, so I have one more poll, and that is about the column two countries. Which one of these are not column two countries? So there are five countries there, Cuba, North Korea, Iran, Russia, and Belarus. This is a little bit mean because there were for decades, only two column two countries. And then this spring, we added two more. So Cuba and North Korea are the countries that have been column two countries for decades. And we recently added Russia and Belarus as additional column two countries. That means if you're importing these items from Russia or Belarus, 
you're going to pay a higher amount of duty. Iran, interestingly enough, is not a column two country. That was a tricky one, sorry. Here is the same area of the HS, but from the online HTS instead of from the downloaded or paper chapter. It has a lot of very convenient elements. So if you go to the HTS online and then select the search area, you can get here. If you go to view, you'll get to the list of chapters that you can download and a link to an archive of past versions of the HTS, which is super convenient. But this is also very handy. You can note here in the search box that I searched a heading, but you can also search words here. Be careful if you do that because the tariff uses HS language and the words may not overlap the way you think. So always reality test to see if it applies. Anywhere on this page that you see blue text is hyperlinked. On the left side, if you click this statistical suffix column, it will open a new window in CROSS, which we'll talk about shortly, to pull up any published customs ruling with that particular HTS. That can be super handy. I will also tell you a lot of these don't have customs rulings, but it's always a great spot to check. The special rates of duty, these countries abbreviations won't take you to a location, but if you hover over them, hover text will tell you what special program the items qualify for. And then one of my favorite things about this search as compared to a downloaded chapter is that these tabs will take you to the chapter and section notes instead of you having to flip all the way back to the beginning of the section or the beginning of the chapter. And you can also download a chapter from this location. Okay, next we're gonna talk a little bit about how to use the tariff to do classification itself. First is the general rules of interpretation. For these, when you are looking at them, you have to compare items at the same level of indentation and you always start with headings. They are made to compare one four-digit heading to another four-digit heading. GRI-1 is the most common, and it says classify an item using the headings and the legal notes. Almost everything you need to classify can be done this way. That's not to say that it's necessarily simple because those legal notes can be a beast, but usually you can use GRI-1 to classify it. Next is GRI-2, which has two parts. And what it does is expands the scope of the headings to include incomplete or unfinished, disassembled or unassembled, or mixtures of items. So this is your IKEA rule, where you have a desk that comes packed in a flat box. It's got all the pieces of the desk in it. It counts as a box. This is also your unfinished rule where you might be importing a tractor that is 90% assembled, but then they're gonna add tires and hitch components in the US. It's still a tractor, so you would classify it as a tractor. If you have too many options to decide between, then you go to GRI-3. And GRI-3 has three parts, and you use them in order. So the first thing you do is you find the item that is most specific. And this is where it really comes in key that you have to compare at the same indentation level because subheadings are almost always more specific than a heading. So you have to compare apples to apples. So if you have a very specific description, you would use that instead of a generic description. If your two options are equally specific, you move on to GRI 3B that's used for mixtures or composite goods or sets. And that says you classify according to the essential character. For example, there's a decorative lantern that's made of thin rods that have an inner core. They're crisscrossed in a lattice that allows the light to shine and a plastic battery operated light that makes it look like there's a flame in there. Customs ruled that the essential character is the item that it shines through. So since it's wicker lattice, then it's classified in 4602. If it was an iron 
lantern, it would be classified in probably chapter 73. Essential character, we'll, we'll talk about more in a little bit too. 3C is saying that if you are comparing two headings, you would pick the last heading numerically if they are equally specific and you cannot determine that one embodies the character more than the other. So we have an example of frames with extensions that are attached to microfiber. It's made to clean glass windows. They're made of aluminum, plastic, and polyester. Each of those pieces are equally important and play a specific role. The plastic part is classified in chapter 39. The microfiber is classified in chapters 50 through 63. And the aluminum is classified in 76. All of them are equally specific. All of them are essential. So you would classify the item in chapter 76. GRI 4 is for the thing that it's most alike. An example of this is a wearable umbrella was being imported. We don't have any provision in the HTS for wearable umbrellas. This one rests across the shoulders, has a cutout for the head, and it had clear plastic sheeting on a light steel framework that protected the upper arms. It has small straps that you can hold on to and collapsed into a disc. Customs said, you know what? This is really similar to an umbrella. So we're going to classify it as an umbrella using GRI 4. And then GRI 5 covers how to classify packaging. If something is shaped or fitted specifically to an item, like a violin case for a violin, then it would be classified with the violin if it is sold with the violin. And if you have a cardboard box, you would classify it with the contents of the cardboard box. The only time you don't classify something with its contents is if it's suitable for long-term or reusable use, then you may classify it separately. And then GRI 6 is the last of the international GRIs. And it says, once you have used the GRIs to find a heading, then you use the GRIs to find a subheading. We have additional US GRIs. Each country is allowed to add another GRI and we added one with four parts. The first part is the US principal use of product at the time of import is the way that you would classify it. So if you are importing tires to use as planters, you would still classify them as tires for vehicles or rubber tires instead of as planters. 1B says that if you are classifying something that is, has a use provision, you have to use it that way and prove that you did so within three years of entry. 1C says if there is a specific provision for an item, you use that to classify it instead of just classifying it as a part unless the legal notes tell you otherwise. And then 1D says you use Section 11 legal notes for textiles. Essential character is a really key concept that's for GRIs 2 and 3B, and it is argued extensively. These are some of the concepts that have been determined to be important you, by court cases and customs ruling. So essential character is a single attribute that marks or distinguishes what an article is, that attribute that's indispensable to the structure, core, or condition of the article, and it is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. It could be determined by the nature of the material, the bulk, the quality, the quantity, the weight, the value, or its role in relation to the use of the whole product. So we have an example of essential character here. I'm gonna launch a poll that you can look at. This product is a silicone mat that's used for holding surgical tools and allowing them to be steady during transfer from person to person during a surgical procedure. It has magnets inside of it. The silicone rubber 
hold, takes care of the instruments, so it keeps them from being damaged, and it keeps them from sliding. It keeps the mat from sliding while the magnets hold on to the instruments. Is your opinion that it should be classified as an article of plastic where silicone is, as magnets, or as an accessory of medical instruments? I'm really intrigued because your instincts are following where mine were following, which is, okay, this is probably a medical item or the silicone is the most important part because it prevents the damage and it keeps the mat in place. But customs ruled that the indispensable and distinguishing part, the essential character is the magnets. So without the magnets, the mat would not be able to hold the instruments and would not allow for hands-free transfer during procedures. The magnet is the most important part that does the essential work. So when you're classifying, the steps you should take are know your product. First, fully, as much as you can, understand the item that you're looking at. Know its composition, the way it functions, the way that it will be used. If there are technical drawings or sales literature, get those. If it's a composite good and you can use bills of material, do that. And talk to your experts, your engineers, your product stewardship. Know who you can reach out to. Then identify possible headings. So with that mat, I have three headings that I would look at. And then take a look at section and chapter notes to eliminate or redirect or include your item, then you want to look at your chapter notes and follow those same steps. If you were not able to use GRI 1, move on to the other GRIs and move on and do the same thing at the subheading level once you've selected a heading. Whatever you do, make sure that you document it. So not only is it a kindness for future people in your role, but it is also really nice for future you. When you're first starting, it doesn't feel like that, but after you've classified hundreds of items and thought about millions of other things in your job, your logic when you first classified something won't make as much sense as it did while you were doing it. So always keep a log at a minimum of the headings you considered and why you eliminated them and write down all of your legal reasoning. So your GRIs, your notes, and the like. Okay, now we get to talk about the most fun part of classification, the arguments around it. So there's two major types of logic that provide the basis for interpretation here in the United States. The first one is a customs binding ruling, and the second one is court cases. So a binding ruling is done at the request of the importer or exporter or someone with direct interest in the questions. And when customs says interest, they don't mean me who's nosy about thinking about all of it. They mean you have a financial stake in how it's classified. There are two places that you can send it. You can send it to either customs headquarters or the National Commodity Specialist Division. NCSD can only rule on prospective transactions. So you might see headquarters rule on situations that are being protested or that have already happened. These are then published in the Customs Bulletin and on the Customs Ruling Online Search System or CROSS. A ruling is a written statement and the ruling letter is issued in response to a written request. You have to submit requests for rulings in a letter form with all of the relevant facts. Customs issues rulings on all sorts of things. We're talking specifically about classification today, but there's value, there's broker rulings, there's carrier rulings, origin, free trade agreements, all sorts of stuff. You cannot get a ruling if the issue is pending before the Court of International Trade. If you don't like a ruling, you can escalate it, you can appeal it, and you can go back, especially if you get one by New York and you can then appeal it up to headquarters, and sometimes they are overturned. Rulings are legally binding from the day you get them until they are modified or revoked. 
Customs warns you that you should not rely on a ruling letter to someone else because there could be circumstances that aren't the same as yours that are private or confidential. So you shouldn't overly rely on the ruling of a similar item. But it's still good to read and stay abreast of rulings so that you are aware of the way customs looks at things. Then there are court cases. The Court of International Trade, the Supreme Court, which the Supreme Court has only gotten involved in a couple classification cases ever since the Court of International Trade was set up, but they still can. And the Appeals Court for the Federal Circuit. Court cases set precedent and they guide classification in the future. So there's a few court cases on this list. They are obviously not the only court cases that are significant, but these are some that are referred to extensively in rulings and future court cases. So if they cover topics that you deal with, it may be a good idea to read the conclusion of these rulings. Court cases are generally set up when a protest has failed and the matters escalated to the courts. These are law, obviously. So there's several cases on how to classify parts. U.S. versus Willoughby was on camera tripods. And the conclusion was that tripods are not parts of a camera, even though they're designed to be used with a camera. Pompeo had superchargers for use in certain vehicles. They're optional, but they are dedicated solely for use in autos, so they are parts. And then Bauerhin had a seat insert and canopy for kids' car seats and said they should be part of car seats. The Court of Appeals turned over some of the Court of International Trade ruling, saying that the cushion is not part of the car seat, but canopies are part of it. I did not include rollerblade versus United States. That brought accessories into the light where they were talking about like elbow and knee pads that you use with roller skates. And they said protective gear is not accessories. They enhance the safety of the user, but they don't impact the roller skates at all. So they are not parts of skates or accessories of skates. If you are looking for these court cases, you can generally Google the name of the court case and find it. And you can also find a lot of detail around how it's been used since then. Then there is detail on principal use analysis. So the carborundum factors are seven factors that were established during this court case that are used to determine whether goods are a particular class or kind. I'm not gonna tell you all the factors because it's irrelevant to today, but it's really interesting. And then Clarendon marketing, the determination there that trickled down was that a principal use provision takes precedence over a name provision. So that's where we get that if you're trying to decide between use or name, use is more specific. Then there's a number of tariff engineering cases. Tariff engineering is when an importer changes the characteristics of a product in order to import it at a lower rate. So Heartland imported a sugar syrup and the Court of Appeals said, hey, this syrup does not represent a legitimate commercial mixture. You made something that would never exist during the course of normal manufacturing cycle just to skip tariffs. That's not allowed. You have to stop doing that. Ford added a row of seating to their transit van. The van was made to be either used as cargo or passenger. It's 25% duty as cargo and 2.5% duty as passenger. So Ford, when they imported all of them, put in another row of seating that they took out after import so they could use some of them for cargo. Court of International Trade said, hey, that's cool. It was appealed. And the Court of Appeals said that row of seating was auxiliary. The principal use is for cargo. These are actually cargo vans at 25% duty. And you cannot ignore the post-import use when you decide the classification, which had a lot of impact because we classify 
based on the status at the time of import, but the Court of Appeals said you also have to take into account how it's used after. All right, so here is a ruling from January on disposable plastic connectors. This is a sterile recirculating connector with a cap. It's imported in a pack. It's connected to a bloodline for dialysis, and it allows the tubing to be rinsed prior to treatment. So your options are 3917 as a fitting for a tube or 9018 as parts of medical device. So this is a ruling where customs brought out their legal notes and they looked pretty extensively at them. So section 15, which covers metal, the note two to those notes says throughout the tariff schedule, parts of general use means articles of heading 7307, 7312, 7315, 7317, or 7318, and similar articles of other base metals. But then in chapter 90, note 1F says that this chapter does not cover parts of general use as defined in note 2 to section 15 of base metal or similar goods of plastics, chapter 39. The explanatory notes say that parts of general use are not considered as parts of articles, but in the heading of the section appropriate for them. So bolts for central heating radiators are classified as bolts instead of parts of radiators, and springs for cars are classified in springs instead of as cars. Note 8 to chapter 39 says that for the purposes of 3917, tubes, pipes, and hoses means hollow products whether they're semi-manufactured or finished, used for conveying, conducting, or distributing gases or liquids. So I'm gonna end this poll. You guys are pretty even with a light bend toward parts of medical devices. And this is, to me is a fascinating one because in order to figure out where it went, customs said that they had to go to the Detail around 7307, which covers fittings for metal items. And the explanatory notes for those say it also includes fittings and being a connector means that they're a connector first. So just by being a connector for a dialysis machine doesn't take it away from being a connector. Therefore, there are parts of general use and they have to always be classified in their own headings instead of as a part and they meet the definition of tube fittings. So GRI-1 places them in 3917. One of the handouts that we provide when this is all over is the handout on parts of general use. It's a handy one if you have to classify a lot of parts. So customs conclusion on this was that fittings for dialysis use are actually in 3917 as fittings. All right. Synthetic ice panels. We have interlocking tiles of high density polyethylene or HDPE that are mounted together to form artificial ice skating surface for any climate. These were originally classified under 3918 by an NCSD ruling. These are synthetic ice panels. They are designed to be used to practice hockey. They're formulated to mimic the friction coefficient and glide properties of ice skating rinks. They can be put indoor or outdoor and make a skating surface. So 3918 covers floor coverings of plastics. The council for the importer requested reconsideration and said customs didn't look at the use as sports equipment to practice skills in the sport of ice hockey. It's designed, marketed, and used as an ice hockey training aid. Chapter 39, Legal Note 2, excludes items that are classified in Chapter 95. So Customs Headquarters said, okay, we have to look at Chapter 95. 9506 covers equipment for sports. Sports equipment is not a defined term in the HDS, so we use common meanings, including dictionary definitions, and we also use court case meetings. There was a court of appeals ruling that defined sports equipment as items that are necessary, useful, or appropriate for a sport. 
they have to be separate from a user. So these are not strapped to a user at all. They're not part of a user. They are very separate. So they can fit in 9506. Therefore, they are not classified in 3918. And Customs Headquarters revoked the prior ruling and said these are classified as 9506. Use that going forward. Next up, we have some wood blinds. These were originally ruled on by New York in 2008. They are components for wood blinds, slats, bottom rails. Some of them brought in were stained or painted, and some of them had UV coatings in addition to the stains and paintings. After they're imported, they're cut to length, hole punched, and assembled with cords and hardware. New York classified them in 4409. Customs put out an updated ruling only on the UV coating. They said the original ruling was correct for those that didn't have UV coating, but they said that the explanatory notes to 4409 exclude wood that is surface worked beyond planing, sanding, painting, staining, or varnishing, and redirects that to 4421. So then they had to look at whether a UV coating is something in addition to painting, staining, or varnishing. Customs had previously ruled that polyurethane and acrylic finishes are excluded from 4409, and this UV coating is similar to those. So it kicked all of the elements that were previously in 4409 to 4421. And I bring this up to let you know that even when you have a ruling, it can still be overturned. 15 years later. And that's one reason that if you are basing your classification off a ruling that isn't to you, you want to stay very current on rulings and overturned rulings because customs notified the importer that they had originally issued the ruling to, but they're not going to notify anyone who just uses the ruling. So make sure you pay attention. Next up, we have helium tanks. These are designed for one-time use. They are not refillable. So when they are imported full, they're classified in 2804 helium gases. When they are imported empty, they're classified in 7311 containers for compressed gas of iron or steel. These are made in one country. They're shipped to another to be filled. They hold helium gas to fill balloons, and the valve that's on there prevents the tank from being refilled. So I just put out a poll about which GRI is used for determining the classification when they are full. Why does the classification change when they are filled? And this is cheating a little bit because I'm not letting you look at the list of GRIs, so you're just having to go off of your memory. All right, I'm going to call the poll. Okay, so you're pretty evenly split across GRI 1, 4, or 5. Very few of you picked the additional US GRI. GRI 1 says you classify according to the headings and the legal notes. GRI 4 says most alike. And then GRI 5 covers the classification of packing items and containers. 5B specifically says, subject to the provisions of Rule 5A, packing materials and packing containers entered with the goods therein shall be classified with the goods if they are of a kind normally used for packing such goods. It's not binding when packing materials are suitable for repetitive use, but these are not, so you can classify them that way. Next up, we have a plastic vehicle organizer. Customs classified these as 8708, parts and accessories of the bodies of motor vehicles. This is especially interesting to me after we looked at the court cases. And this is from a New York ruling. There's a headquarters ruling from 2021 where customs revoked a bunch of rulings that placed backseat car organizers in 8708 and 4202 and ruled that they have to be classified under 6307 as other made up articles, specifically because parts and accessories must be identifiable as being suitable for use solely or principally with vehicles. 
a car can function without backseat organizers and being clipped on doesn't count as installed. It's not an accessory because it does not affect the operation or effectiveness of the vehicle. Instead, the organizers merely allow the driver and passengers to store items needed for enjoyment or convenience, but not for operation of the vehicle, which means that I expect that this recent ruling that places the vehicle organizers in 8708 could be challenged or overturned because it goes against that headquarters conclusion very strongly and didn't provide any reasoning. If you want to get good reasoning for something, look for headquarters rulings. They put more of their thought process into the ruling letter than the NCSD rulings tend to. Finally, we have temperature screening devices. They're designed to provide readings of human body temperature via non-contact skin measurements from the human face. It's an infrared camera, visual imaging camera, temp reference source, ethernet cable power adapter, and a power cord. The infrared camera provides a thermal image of the human subject and the visual imaging camera provides a visual image. Both of them include firmware and facial recognition software. It acts as a thermometer and then displays the temperature on a separate device that's not included at import. It'll trigger an alarm if there's elevated temperature. So these were imported under 9025 and then customs liquidated some under 9027 and others under 9013. So especially when you're dealing with different ports, customs doesn't always agree with each other. The importer protested and said, we think they're 9025 and also you guys can't agree. Because they couldn't agree, customs escalated to headquarters for further review. The note three to section 16 says composite machines are classified as if consisting of the component of the machine that provides the principal function. And there are temperature screening devices under note 9025. So they're classified, it's multiple machines working together to get a body temperature reading, and they're correctly classified as 9025. There's a bunch of resources that we're gonna send out to you, HTS, Schedule B, some archives, the ITC learning tool on how to classify. FROSS, again, super handy for looking at rulings, some guidelines on how to submit a ruling, the bulletin where relevant rulings are published, and NCSD does trade outreach webinars where they educate you on how they are classifying specific classes of goods. They're super handy. We'll also include our parts of general use handout. And we appreciate your time today, and it was great to talk to you. Thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic day. I look forward to hearing any questions via email.